I've always heard about DNA computing, but until recently, I never really understood it. I mean, DNA storage for information is obvious, right? We, we store information in computers in bits and ones and zeros, and we could translate those over to the language of DNA bases and do similar storage. But how could DNA actually do computations? And why would we want it to? Well, the first reason is that it's incredibly small. You've likely seen warehouses filled with supercomputers. DNA is working at such a small level that even the biggest DNA computers could fit in a test tube. The second is that it's energy efficient, right? As, as efficient as chips that we make can be, DNA is just ridiculous in its ability to perform actions with very, very little energy. And the third and most exciting is that DNA can work in parallel. So while computers that we use have to do all of their actions one at a time, with DNA, millions or billions of molecules of DNA could act at the same time performing the same calculations, which unlocks a whole new form of problem that we can solve. These problems are known as NP-complete problems. And basically they're challenges where there are so many possible routes to explore that a computer exploring them one by one, it theoretically would eventually find a solution, but it would take an infinite amount of time to get there. And so practically computers aren't able to do these things. But a DNA computer, which is able to search all those possibilities in parallel, theoretically might be able to solve some of those problems. In 1994, Leonard Adelman created the field of DNA computing, and the first experiment he did was solving a Hamiltonian path problem, which is a famous example of an NP-complete problem. And basically what that means is we have a graph, we have a set of points, and they're all connected in different ways, right? Maybe you can go from point one to point two, but not from point two to point one. And you can go from point one to three and three back to one. And so you've got this whole graph of possibilities. And you're trying to find a way to go from the beginning to the end while touching every point once, but none more than once. And the question is, is that possible? And for a small graph, I mean, for very small graphs, you could do this with your eyes in, in a minute. Uh, but as that graph gets larger, the number of possibilities expands exponentially, and it's a problem that computers practically aren't able to solve when the graph gets really big. And so what Adelman set out to do was to use a smaller graph kind of as a test run, but to show that DNA on its own was able to solve these types of problems while working in parallel. And so this is the original paper that Adelman wrote, and this field has changed and evolved in a lot of ways since 1994, especially on the storage side. But from everything I've read, this is actually the best place I've found to start to understand how it's actually possible for DNA to do computations. And so what I want to do in this video is to walk through the exact experiment that Adelman did, recreating it with code so that we can see an exact simulation of how DNA computing is actually possible and how he got a bunch of molecules to act in a way that they actually solve this graph problem. So to start, we need a graph. So I'm just gonna draw something up here. And let's say we have these points. Um, and the same thing could happen if this was cities on a map or anything else, but we'll just keep it abstract. And we'll say that the goal is to go from this starting point to this ending point. Uh, and we'll know that this, there's only one real way through it. And that's to go like this. Uh, but if that was the whole problem, it would be very easy. There's only one option at each step. It wouldn't be very hard to solve. And so we want to add a bunch of other steps that are possible so that the computer needs to find this path as the correct answer. So I'll take a minute and do that now. So this is our graph. And you can see that if a computer was trying to solve this, it would have a lot of paths to explore, right? It would go from I to D, and then it could say, oh, from D we could go to N or to L, and from N we go to A, and from L we could go to A, but we could also go down to O. And so it would need to explore all of these things, and it would have to do them one at a time. And with a graph this small, a computer would have no problem doing that, but it's a good example of the type of problem, and as this grows, the complexity for computers would grow exponentially. And so what I want to do is to put this into code so that we have something to work with. Uh, so I'll write down all the names of the vertices. Uh, and then we're going to just have this variable that's the total number of vertices. And then we want to capture all the edges that are in here as well. So I've got it here, and we can just 
create a list of all of the edges that are a part of this. So we know we can go from zero to one, that's the line from I to L, from zero to two, that's the line from I to O, and I'll fill in the rest of these. All right, so we now have all the names of these points and we have encoded the possible steps that we are allowed to take between them. And so now we're ready to actually start the steps of the experiment that Adelman did. So, so let's go over to his paper and you can see here he outlines the five steps that need to happen for us to solve this problem. Uh, first, we want to generate random paths through the graph, right? This is the beauty of DNA, that we can solve every possible path through in parallel at the same time with very little effort. But now we've got all of these possibilities, we don't know which one actually solves the problem. So we've got to start filtering. So first we filter only the ones that go from the one we want to be the start to the end. So in our case, these are paths that go from I to A, and then we'll get rid of anything that doesn't do that. The next step is to make sure that it has exactly eight steps, because we know if it's going to touch every point once and no point more than once, it's got to have exactly eight steps. Then we can make sure that it touches all the points one time, uh, or that it at least touches all the points one time. So we can say, okay, does this path go to L? Does this go to O? Does this go to V? And once we've done that for all of them, we've made sure that it's eight steps that goes to all of them once. That, def by definition, that means that it's gone to all the points once and it is a Hamiltonian path. And so if any are left, we want to scoop those out and, and figure out what the answer is. So we'll go through those steps one at a time. And let's start with the first one. So before we even do that, we want to prepare the pieces we need. So to do this, we need to encode each of these points in DNA. And there's no special significance to how they translate. We just need to make sure that each of them is unique enough that they will only bind in the ways that we want them to. Uh, so first, just a quick lesson in how DNA binds. There's four bases in DNA, A, T, G, C, uh, and DNA is double-stranded. So I won't draw the helix, but basically any A in one strand binds to a T in the other, T binds to an A, a G binds to a C, and a C binds to a G. So if we had uh, a sequence that said A, 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 uh, and we put it near something that was C, 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 nothing's going to happen. But if we put it near something that was T, 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 all of a sudden those bonds will form and it will, and it will stick together. Uh, so we're going to use this as the trick in order to create these paths. And how can we do that? Well, let's say that rather than looking at a path that has eight steps, as a simple example, let's look at a path that has four steps, right? And we're going to call these steps A, T, G and C and say that's the path through and those are the only options and we're going to encode A as A A A A A and we're going to encode T as T T T T T and G as G G G G and C as C C C C well from that point they have no way of knowing that this that this set of steps is possible right we put all these together they're not going to know how to bind but we know the edges that exist and so if we can create a complementary strand that will bond to this and this only because that edge exists, it starts to enable us to do it. So as an example, this edge from T to A, we want to get something that will bind to the end of A and something that will bind to the beginning of T. So if we made a complementary strand that was T, T, A, A, then what that's going to do is it's going to grab that and grab that and it creates the ability for those two to stick together, right? Similarly, this, if we created a, A, C, C, it'll grab that and grab that. And if we created C, C, G, G, it'll grab that and grab that. So we can create complementary strands for the edges that overlap in a way that will put together each piece of DNA that represents a vertex with only the pieces that it's allowed to bond to, right? Do you understand that if T and A exist, if that's one and that's two and that's three, there's no way for A to go with C because there's no, there's no uh, edge strand that's going to attract it enough in order to make that connection. Now, the one problem here is that now we've got these loose pieces dangling that we don't really want. And so in reality, and in the experiment, what he did is he made these ones longer. 
So that would be a little longer. That would be a little bit longer. And now we've got this, this set of, of complementary edge strands that will allow our, our pieces to only bind in the way that they're allowed. And now what's cool with this is say the graph was such that A and G could also combine. Well, then we would make one that was T, 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 C, C. And it'll bind to this, and it actually allows these ones to go in there too. Right, so we can create, they don't need to just be one, one path through, we can create these edges that allow all these different combinations to exist. And so what we wanna do, uh, rather than having them be as simple as A, 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 T, 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 we'll make these strands randomly that represent it. And uh, the way that Adelman did it is he made the strands 20 bases long. Part of this was for the math of making sure oh, we won't accidentally have some overlap that makes it not work. The other part is that if it's 20 bases long, then the connections on each side are 10 bases. And 10 base connections are stable at room temperature. So that's more of a, a bio detail than a, than a kind of algorithmic detail, but we'll, we'll copy that as well. Okay, and before we get into that, we're gonna make two more things here that are gonna be helpful for us. Uh, the first is a dictionary that tells us uh, for each base what it connects to. So this will be make it easier rather than having to do that manually at each step. Um, this will be able to give us those answers. Uh, and then the other is how long do we want these uh, strands to be? So we'll just decide that that's 10 based on what Adelman did. And so with that, we can start putting together our random strands. So just to, as an example, we can do this. Um, if we start, if we know that all the keys from the pairings are all the bases that are possible, we can just pull from that. Um, and we can say for blank in range. Okay. So this is just gonna take the length of K and give us a strand of random DNA bases that is that long. Uh, so let's pop over to the terminal and we can do Python DNA pi and we can see, okay, we got, we got a list of, of 10 bases that's random. Now to make sure that's a string, we're just gonna join that together. And you can see now we've, we've got our random 10 digit string. And then the last step here is we wanna make that into a list, not just of one possible string, but of as many as we have vertices. Uh, so we'll make another list comprehension and we'll say, and let's see what we got. Yeah, let's see, I missed something there. I think I got too many. There we go. So we have eight vertices here, and this gave us eight random DNA strings uh, to work with. So that's perfect. Uh, we can take that and save it. Um, and let's actually print a little update. So perfect. All right, the beginning of step one is done. So rather than in the example I gave, we had those random strands and we made complementary edges. Uh, what we're actually gonna do here, just to keep it a little bit simpler, is that we will create the edges as basically just the second half of one and the first half of the other. And then we'll create complements of these whole strands. So it does the exact same thing, we're just flipping and doing the, the exact inverse. So let's make a quick function here that uh, finds the ver takes in the vertices and the edges and finds what we need. So um, we're, let's see, we're gonna do a list comprehension where we take in the edges. So we'll say vertex one, vertex two in edges. And then what do we wanna do with that? We want to put together the end of the first vertex and the beginning of the second. So we'll take vertices, V1, and then the amount that we want is half of K. Uh, so we'll do that, plus vertices V2. Um, and on this one, we want up to K over two. And so that, that will give us what we need. The problem, like I said before, is we don't just want the first half and the second half because for the first 
strand and for the last strand, we actually want to extend those a little longer and uh, and make them make them go all the way to the end so there's not that dangling loose end. And so what we're going to want to replace is we want to replace uh, the f anything that is the end of the first vertex. So we'll uh, take the last five digits of that and we want to replace it with the whole thing. Uh, and so let's do, actually, and then for the other one, we want the last vertex and we want anything that is representing taking the first digits of that taking the first digits of that uh, and again we want to replace it with the whole thing uh, so the easiest way to do that is just to return strand dot replace that uh, dot replace that for strand in edge strands. And now we can call that and we've got those vertex strands to pass in and the edges and we can print let's give ourselves some space edge strands create. All right, so let's go back and see how we did there. V1 is not defined. I didn't say four. There we go. So you can see we've got these eight strands that are representing the letters I, L, O, V, E, D, N, A. And then for each of them, um, we've created a strand that's the end of one and the beginning of the other if those strands have an edge. And for anything that's connecting to the first one, we've made it a little longer by extending it to go the whole way. And for anything that goes to the last one, we've done the same thing. So we've got the edge strands. Uh, the last thing we want is the complements because remember, we didn't make the edge strands complement. We made them the same as the actual pieces. Now we got to make the complements of the first one. Um, so we'll do find complement strand. You know, technically, DNA doesn't run left to right like we read it. It runs five prime to three prime. And so if we're doing the complement, we usually uh, want to go the other way. But because we're using computers and looking at these on the screen, the easiest thing to do is to just do it left to right. So uh, what we'll do is we'll make the output empty and we'll say for nucleotide in the strand, uh, output plus equal, and then we want to add the pairing of that nucleotide. And return output and then and so now we can find the complements for each of those and we can say find complement uh, V for V in vertex strands and we can print that out too. Give ourselves some space complements created. All right uh, and let's see how that goes. Perfect. So you can see we've got our strands, we've got the edges, and we've got the complements. And you can see if you look at the strands and the complements, they match up, right? We've got A, A, C, G, T, T, G, C. And that's that's true for all of them. So now we've got the tools created, right? We've, we're basically where he was to start. And we're ready for step one, which is to create random paths through the graph. So in Adelman's experiment, now all he had to do was mix these strands of DNA together, right? We've created the pieces so that they have ligation reactions in a way that starts to solve all the possible options for the graph. Uh, for us, we got to get a little more creative. So um, first, we want to amplify all of them, right? We only have one example of each of these. He's got lots. So let's make let's make 100,000 of each um, and let's shuffle them up. So now we've got 100,000 of them that are all mixed up. And so what we want to do is first create a list of all the strands we've created. Uh, and then we're going to work on one at a time. So we're going to say growing strand is nothing. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to go through uh, all of these edges that we created. And so we've got 100,000 of each. So we've got about we've got 800,000 of them. And we want to say, if we don't have anything in the growing strand yet, so if the length of that is zero, uh, then we'll just add this new, this strand to the growing strand. So it becomes the first one. 
otherwise, so, so let's imagine we've got something in that growing strand. How do we decide what should bind to it, right? DNA, this is happening automatically, but for us to simulate it, we've got that strand. What we wanna say is, if there is a edge that overlaps with the last five digits or last five bases of that strand, then anything that binds to the next five digits of that edge is allowed to go next. And so since we're cycling through them all, we've got a proposal for what could be next, right? We're, we've got this next possible strand. And we wanna say, if the last five of this and the first five of this, there is an edge that connects them, then we can add it onto the strand. So first let's make uh, kind of the target of the edge that we're looking for. And we wanna say, find the complement of uh, the growing strands, what, last, last five, so. Um, that should be outside the brackets. Uh, and then we want to add that to the complement of this new one's first five. Uh, so now we've got this edge that would need to exist for this to, to be viable. And so we can say then if target comp uh, is in complements, then growing strand adds the S. Uh, otherwise, we're just gonna we're gonna move along. So this is gonna correctly make the strand, but it'll keep going forever. So how do we know when to stop? So how did they do this in the real experiment? Well, if there's no edges out of the last strand, then it would just sit there, and all the other things would happen in parallel, right? That that would be fine, because we're not doing things in parallel. We're simulating it on a computer. We need to tell it when to give up. Uh, so we need to to encode that in. So if the growing strands um, last ten are equal to the last thing in the vertex strands, which is which is what we made, then we want to take our list of overall strands and add this on, and we want to take that and reset it to nothing. So now we should have a whole bunch of random paths that start from whatever random thing came first, navigate through only edges that are allowed, and end up at that last strand. So. Uh, here we can actually do as an example, if we just say print path strand zero, so we're gonna print the first one that we got. And, so it took me longer than it should have to find that. Uh, I missed that equal sign there, so it was just adding it and not doing anything with that. Uh, so we can see now it's making all those random edges, it's making all the full strings of the paths that are possible, and we're just asking it for the first one. And then, so if we look, that's, C T G T A. So we can see, all right, there's, there's where that started. Um, and then T C A is where it ended. And then it, the next one that was allowed to bond was A A G C G, which is A A G C G. So we can see these edges that make up the path that, that we could then decode. Uh, so rather we don't need to do much with them now though, cause we've got every possible path, which is, uh, includes lots of stuff that we don't want to know about. So we can just say, uh, see, of path strands. And if we go back here, it's gonna take a little bit to run. It's gonna find all those combinations and it's gonna say, okay, we've got, we've created these strands. We have 34,000 of them. So now we have 34,000 possible paths through. Lots of these are repeats of the same ones, right? We didn't do anything to say stop when you got the right one because we can't do that with DNA. So all we said was take all of these, explore all the options, now we've got a pool of 34,000 paths uh, and we hope that the right one's in there. And same, this is the same thing Adelman did, right? He now has a vat filled with DNA that represents paths. The problem is solved, but we can't get to the answer. And so the rest of the experiment is filtering those down to get to the right answer. So let's jump to step two, which is remove paths without correct start and end. Uh, Okay, so how did they do this with DNA? Uh, you can see here to implement step two, the product was amplified by polymerase chain reaction using primers uh, 0 and 06. Uh, so PCR is a way of massively amplifying DNA. And so they didn't actually cut out the paths that didn't do this. They just drowned them out by massively amplifying the ones with the right ends. So PCR needs a primer to start. And so they were able to use a primer that represented the beginning, a primer that represented the end. and so those paths from the beginning to the end were 
multiply millions of times and kind of drowned out all the other options, right? Because uh, as they're going through all these steps, they're kind of losing some pieces. And so if they make the entire pot 99% the right ones, they know that by the time they get to the end, they're gonna, they're gonna have the right answers. So uh, how do we replicate that? Well, we already have um, filters for ones that end in the right spot, right? They, uh, they didn't have that ability. We had to tell it to stop somehow. So we told it to stop at the end. So that's already taken care of. But basically we can just say, we wanna keep all of these if um, the path up to K is equal to vertex strand zero and the path, uh, the last K of the path is equal to vertex strands minus one. Uh, so that should be taking all of those strands and if the beginning is the first one and the end is the last one, uh, then we're then we're good to go. So okay, let's see how that goes. So it's going to run and get all these possibilities. It's going to tell us how many strands we have, and then it's going to filter. And it says none got through the filter, which seems very unlikely to me. So first off, I'm going to spread these out a little, and ah, I said from ten to the end. I meant from 10 away. And let's actually move this down to 10,000. We may need more later, uh, although I don't think we will, and that'll help it run a lot faster. There we go. So we can see uh, it made 3,400 strands, and then we wanted to filter for the ones with the right start and end, and now we're down to 762. So that's great. We're done step two, and we're ready for step three, which is that we only want to keep the paths with n vertices. Uh, in our case, that's eight. In his case, that was seven. So how did they do this in the real experiment, right? We've got a bunch of DNA. It makes sense, okay, we could get rid of the ones that don't start and end in the right place. It makes sense we can make all these paths. But how do we start filtering it based on the length? Uh, well, there's a technique called gel electrophoresis. I don't exactly know how to pronounce it. Uh, but basically the idea is that we've got a type of gel and we put the DNA in it and we stimulate it with electricity. And the DNA, because it's Neg it's negatively charged, uh, it wants to wiggle away from that, and it wiggles at a pace that is inversely proportional to how small it is. So the, the really small fragments of DNA are gonna move faster, the big D fragments of DNA are gonna move slower, and we can, we can kinda start with doing this with, with fragments that we know the length of and kinda use those as benchmarks so that we can see based on how far DNA wiggled, uh, how long it is. And so we know we've encoded everything here with strands that are 10 bases long per step. And so all we need to do is say, we're only gonna let things through, in our case that are eight steps, so we're only gonna let things through that are 80 bases long. So once we've poured all the DNA on here, done this, we can take that slice that's 80 bases long and only work with that going forward and basically eliminate uh, paths of every other length. Uh, so that's how he ran it in the experiment. Uh, for us, it's quite a bit simpler. So we want n step paths. And again, we want path for path in, in and out strands. Uh, if the length of the path is v times 10. And let's print uh, strands with v steps. So let's see there. So we run it and there we go. So we've created 3300, we've filtered from I to A and we're down to 787. And then we filtered for only the ones that are eight steps and we're down to 74. And you can see we're getting a, a little close to running out. So it's possible we need to, to start with a bigger number, but we'll keep this going for now because it's, it's quick. Uh, so the next step is the one that was by far the hardest for them in the lab. Uh, because we've got now we've got all paths that start with from I, end with A, and are eight steps long, but there are other ways to get there, right? If we go back, uh, maybe there's a path that's eight steps long that goes from I to D, to L, to O, to V, uh, to E, to D to N, right? That, that there's, there are other possible ways through that 
would meet those criteria. And the way that we make sure that it's truly a Hamiltonian path is that it's got to only it's got to touch all of them. Because if it's eight steps and it touches all of them, that means it didn't touch any of them more than once. Uh, so how they did this in the lab, let's go back to, to his paper, um, is that we talked about the complements in DNA, right? We talked about how they're, they're only going to pair with a certain type. And so now we have double-stranded DNA. It's not going to pair with anything. But if we split that double-stranded DNA apart, uh, then, we, then the single-stranded DNA is, is back to being kind of ready to, to bond. And if it's got, say, say we're looking for L. And so we know, if we go back to our terminal, when we created these strands, uh, the second one was the strand for L. So we know that L is represented by T, T, G, C, C, uh, G, 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 A, T. Cool. We, we know that that's L. And we know that that will stick if we have its complement, right? If we have A, A, C, G, G, C, 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 T, A. And so what we can do is we can create that complement and we can pour the DNA basically over it, a bead covered in that complement. And anything that has that vertex strand is going to stick to it because it's got that chance to connect. Anything that doesn't will not. Uh, so what he did in the lab is they, they split all the DNA apart into being single-stranded. They created this bead with the complement of the first step of the path. So say for us that's L. We don't need to do I because we already know it starts at I. So say that's L. And we pour it over. And anything that sticks to that bead we know has an L in it. And now we can throw in everything else. We can uh, clean everything off that bead. So now we've got a bunch of ones that we know include L. We can amplify those if we want to make sure we have more. And then we can repeat it for O. Right? So we create a bead that's got the complement of the O strand, and we pour it over that, and then we take it off. And we do that for V, and we do it for E, and we do it for D, and we do it for N. We already know it ends in A. And so once we've done it for each of those steps, we know that everything that's left had all of those uh, bases, had all those strands on it. Uh, and this is, in my opinion, the most genius step of the whole thing, right? Because it, it makes sense to me how you could do all those other tests. People know uh, about running things through agarose gels to find the length. Like this, it all seems... Uh, like not that difficult to solve. This is the step where when I was thinking about it on my own, I couldn't come up with the answer of how do you make sure it's touched every point once. Uh, so let's let's recreate that piece in code. And so what we're gonna do is we'll first just copy it. Um, you'll see why in a second. So what we wanna say is included equals, and do the same thing, path for path in included, uh, if vertex strands um, and let's say we're doing L, so that B vertex strands one is in the path. All right, print length of included. So if we go uh, to the terminal here, we can see that it's going to run, and it says of those 71, 50 of them include L. And then we could do that again for O and again for V. So we want to we want to make a loop here and say for I in, in range. So for each of the strand, uh, vertex strands. Um, and first we wanna run this, but rather than just checking one, we're gonna check off. So we're gonna run through for zero, for one, for two, for three, all the way all the way through to the end. And then we wanna say, uh, I guess let's just, let's just give updates at each step. So if uh, I equals zero, so if it's the first one, or I equals the length of vertex strands minus one, so these are the ones that we already knew were there. Uh, so we can say already checked for vertex names i. Uh, else, and now let's let's kind of give the update. So uh, eliminating paths not including vertex names i. Uh, and then here's how many is left. And I guess after we're done all of them, we can do kind of the normal update strands, including all vertices uh, at least once is length of included. All right, let's see how that works. So we had 73 that had eight steps. We already checked for I, so we don't need to do that again. And then L, okay, that brought it down to 65. O, all of them had that, so it didn't eliminate any. V, all of them had it. 
E down to 37 and down to 28. And so now we know we have 28 strands that have eight steps, include all the letters once, which means that they are, and start from I and end in A. And so we know that any path that's left in that batch is going from I to A while touching everything uh, only once. And so now the last step here is just to extract any paths that remain. And so how do they do that in the lab? Uh, well, basically now they have uh, remaining DNA strands that are all either identical to each other or all different solutions. And any of those will give them the answer. So in their case, they use PCR again, just to amplify it to make sure that they, uh, that they really had lots of it. Um, and then they were able to take it out and sequence it uh, using kind of normal DNA sequencing techniques and then decode that from the strands that they had assigned to the points in the graph and solve the path through it. So for us, we can just say, uh, let's take the first one, that'll be an answer. And uh, we can actually here, let's just do this. For now, print solution. So we can see, there we go, that's our answer. That doesn't really tell us very much. So uh, we need a function that takes that in. And what we're gonna do and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, go through the entire strand and we're gonna jump by 10 because we know that each thing is, is 10 long. And so, um, let's see, S equals strand from uh, I to I plus 10. And then uh, what number is that? So we can say, where, what, what's the position in the original um, array of those strands that that's in. So we can say vertex strands dot index s. So that's gonna tell us which position it's in. And then we can find decoded letter is uh, vertex names of what's the name that's in that position too. And then the path, we can add that decoded letter to. Uh, and I guess we got a return too. And so here we can say path equals decode solution for the solution. And we can print a solution, a string version of the path. And if we go back, we can go through and there we go. So it found 2,600 originally, uh, 602 of those went from I to A, 35 of them had eight steps, and then it filtered to have all the letters, which it went all the way down to 22. We grabbed the first one of those 22, kind of flipped it back into the letters that it was originally encoding for, and it solved the problem of uh, the path through that graph. Uh, so I hope that was interesting and helpful. I'm really excited by it. It seems super cool, uh, and people have done some crazy things in this space around uh, playing tic-tac-toe games and all this stuff. Uh, it's not the kind of thing that DNA computers would obviously ever replace other forms of computing. It's a very specific use case, but it just seems cool that there's this ability to both solve these crazy parallel problems that computers or traditional computers aren't well equipped to do, and also just the, the feeling of doing computation with biology. There's something really cool about that, that uh, this, is, this is a a chemical from nature or a molecule from nature and that we're able to understand and work with it in a way that it just following its its kind of natural reactions is able to solve problems that we have so i'm finding it super fun i hope you learned something today and, and take care